Hello and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. So yeah, so we wanted to cover a few things today. Well, we could talk about the social dilemma. Oh yeah, yeah, what do you think? I thought it was interesting. I thought, I guess there are parts that I sort of agreed with and parts where I felt like it sort of missed the mark a little bit or didn't go far enough. I guess if we're gonna, if this is an episode, we might wanna explain what it was. So The Social Dilemma is a Netflix docudrama um, that sort of flips back and forth between interviews with um, tech employees at, you know, the big companies, Facebook, Google, um, Instagram, Twitter, sort of talking about the um, ails of social media and constant um, being on our devices, um, and it contrasts that with a, a fictional story of this family who's sort of playing out these problems um, for the audience to see. So the most amusing part of that, I guess, is how they decided to portray algorithms. I'm curious what you thought of that depiction, Ryan. Um, did I ever tell you I wanted to make a board game um, about operations? And, and that's pretty much what I had in my head was exactly that bunch of bunch of uh, decisions being made by uh, people at a switchboard pulling levers. Um, so I loved it. I thought it was a very clever way of, of doing it. And, and um, the, the cognitive um, piece is about using information to make decisions, and and then. Um, you know, sort of taking the action and seeing what the results were and then learning from that result. It's pretty much how most, you know, expert systems are built anyway. But I thought it was such a clever way of doing it. And I think they used an actor as well that's been around. Um, yeah, he was in Mad Men. Yeah, yeah. So that, that also made it a bit funny for me. No, I thought it was great. I mean, I, you know, the reason why I wanted to chat about this is, is you know, a lot of these tools, um, and, I, and I think I posted on, on LinkedIn the, the, the new... Um, what's it called? Uh, Pyramid of Needs. What's it, that guy's name? Maslow. Maslow's, um, and it goes through the different levels. I thought that was actually very cleverly done in the sense of, you know, some some social networks are very much around your feeling good about yourself or, or potentially not feeling good about yourself, versus some are professional and some are. Uh, I can't remember what the levels were, and I'll, I'll have to find the image again. Um, but the reason why I thought this whole thing, getting back to the point, is. You know, when we when we design any software, we're trying to do exactly what these guys are doing, uh, or, or what they pointed out in the sense of trying to make not only the system usable but sticky and come back and and, and usable. Um, and yeah, you definitely want it when you when you sort of gamify the application. You definitely want to pull on emotions. Now we don't look on the emotions. You know, if I look at most of the systems, you know, to to make someone depressed or or unhappy. What we're trying to instill or, or get out of them is the do the right thing emotion. Um, well, I've done the right thing, so I should feel good about doing the right thing. Um, and we talk about that from an enterprise point of view. It's things like um, giving back software that you're not using or giving back devices that you're not using, because those are typically things that are of big costs for a company, um, buying licenses or, or you, having hardware. I mean, I'm sitting with, with three laptops with me at the moment that aren't being used. You know, they're just, they're just depreciating and they're not being utilized. Um, but we don't, you know, we've sort of taken a view that we're going to go BYD now. So as long as we can monitor it, we're, we're sort of don't really care what the device is. Um, and those are, you know, where, where the gamification comes in, not, not so much for the, for the operational staff per se, but it's, it's getting the end user to have the right behaviors. Um, I think what, what makes the, the social dilemma interesting is they've taken it on a, on a, on a consumer level. Um, which, which I don't think a lot of people realize that they're actually 
being manipulated mm. um, in the nicest sense of the word. Um, but uh, but it is, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed the movie in the end. I didn't really want to watch it because I kind of felt like it was going to be um, painful to watch. But actually, the more I watched, the more I enjoyed it. Has it made you think about your own habits when it comes to social media? Or are you already, do you already kind of watch how much time you spend? Um, I, I've already, yeah, I've already been on that train. So, I mean, I, you know, when Facebook first came out, you know, said so came out, when it became global, it was one of the, I was, in, in my group of friends, I was one of the first guys on it. So I've been on that for a long, long time. Um, and I've had, you know, high, you know, highs and lows or peaks of usage on it. Um, and, I, and I often sit there and go, actually, I think I'm going to delete it now. I'm going to get rid of my account. And there's always one little thing that keeps me using it. And, and you know, whatever that thing at the time, it always comes back. And at the moment, I'm keeping it um, purely because there are some groups that I'm actually, I'm actually seeing some some value out of that those groups that are not necessarily driven by, um, I don't know, the, the, the more trivial sort of reasons why you're on it. Um, you know, like stalking your friends. <laughs> yeah, stalking your friends. I don't. I actually, I don't follow everyone. Um, I only really look at the groups, uh, and I think that's what's what's different. So the train I've been on is I've, I have no notifications for social media, um, not even WhatsApp, um, which is ironic considering I actually do a lot of communication via WhatsApp. But I schedule time to look at WhatsApp. Um, so every hour I spend five minutes looking at WhatsApp and catch and catching up. Um, or if I'm at the shops, I'll check in case my wife has sent me something to do. Um, but that's that's how I manage it. So it's, it's always a conscious decision for me to look at it as opposed to getting the red uh, icon, a red badge or, or a notification across the top of the screen. So I turn off all those sorts of notifications. I don't have any of that. So, so a lot of the things that they have done to hook you don't really work on someone in my position now because I've, I've deliberately turned all those things off. Um, and even if I look at Facebook, I mean, I limit my social media – to give you an idea, down to 15 minutes a day. Um, and that's LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, um, Telegram, and WhatsApp. Um, now, WhatsApp, obviously, that doesn't make sense because I'm checking it every, every, every hour, but that's the only group, that's the only thing that I'll check outside of that limit um, because it is, as I say, a communication tool, not so much a social media tool for me. Mm-hmm. How do you handle it? Well, honestly, I think if I didn't need to use social media for work, I wouldn't be on it at all. Um, And I was just thinking about how LinkedIn sort of held all of anyone with any sort of business role sort of a little hostage now, because if you don't have a complete LinkedIn profile and some activity, I think you're just not going to get as many job opportunities. Um, And it's become sort of like a professional expectation that you'd maintain that profile. Um, but I've been off, um, Facebook for about a decade. So I actually did this, um, program at, um, my university where we spent a semester without any tech. So it was, it was a spring semester, so it was shorter, but it was a program where we went out to the woods of Maine and sort of lived a communal um, lifestyle studied, um, the authors out there. Um, but we didn't have our devices. There was no, we didn't have internet. So very disconnected. Mm. Um, and that sort of experience before that, I probably would have definitely been checking Facebook every day. And this was before, I think a few people at the program had smartphones, but this was like very early on. So I just had a flip phone, but even just not having my phone, not having anything else to um, really did rewire my brain and sort of break that habit. And then when I came back into that world and got my phone back, it's like, I don't want this anymore. It's such a burden to have to like, feel like you have to, you know, respond to messages right away or, you know, pay attention to these things that really weren't bringing me a lot of value. Um, and after that, I just never really got back into social media in the same way. Um, and even since then, you know, I'll adopt things like Snapchat because, you know, my friends are using it. I want to stay up to date with their lives, but I just find myself not checking it, not checking out, not checking it. And then I, it just kind of falls by the wayside. So that's sort of my pattern now for social. Yeah. And I, and I, I mean, I'd, I would love to do that kind of detox. I just never have the time to do yeah. that. But 
I read a book called Making Time. It's called Make Time or Making Time. Um, and they call these sort of things infinity pools. Um, and it's in, it's in that article that you referenced, The Verge, as well. The problem with a lot of these applications is, and, and this is a continuous scroll thing as well, that you're constantly scrolling, looking for something new. And, and LinkedIn, you find, it's funny you mentioned that because I find that um, I, I always I keep deleting the apps. I delete LinkedIn, I delete Twitter and all the rest of it because I find if they're on my phone, then there's obviously more propensity to pick them up and look at them. Um, however, the reason why I keep them is because I want my contacts to be up to date, my address book. And that all synchronizes through through my phone into an app that does all the sorting and merging and all that kind of stuff. So I tend to not look at, I try not to look at social media on my phone. Uh, I try to look at it on my iPad or on my desktop because I find that scrolling is actually frustrating. So you don't tend to scroll as much. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to scroll on your phone with your thumb because it's obviously designed for that. And so, I, so what I've done now is I've got everything installed again, but they're all hidden away. Um, just so I can get the synchronization to work for the contacts and stuff. Uh, and the reason why I end up doing that, and this is coming back to the make time thing, is, is that what I was finding is that it, when I was getting getting bored or just or, or not not in, engaged in a conversation, like on a conference call or whatever, I would look at, at one of these things to fill to stimulate the brain. Mm-hmm. I've had to physically change that, and, it's, and, I, and I, every so often I fall back into no one's perfect, but I, I've gone back to pen and paper. To, to avoid picking up my phone to look at and, and um, get, get caught in that because you end up getting – that distraction is, is not really um, worth it in the end because now you don't have that opportunity to, to sort of – because you're on that call with someone remote, you can't necessarily walk with them on the way back from the meeting and go, um, so what, what did you hear in that meeting? And you sort of fill in the gaps that you may have in your, in your memory because you, you got distracted. Um, that's that's something I think is you know, the, the make time book was quite clear, were quite, quite well placed in, in at the time for me to, to, to get rid of these things. And there were a couple other techniques about or considerations to turn the notifications off, um, changing your color, the, the color of your screen on your phone from full color to to black and white, um, those sorts of things, which also helps your brain to tune out this constant need to get the you know see what the red thing is. Yeah, uh, which which drives that behavior again. Yeah, definitely. I know. Yeah. I mean, that all comes back to even the they feature in the documentary, the um, I think former Google employee who started the so the Center for Humane Technology or mm, it's yeah. something like that. But he really started this um, digital wellness movement. I think he was the one who suggested the graying out your app icons and everything like that. But he said something he said something in the documentary that kind of drove me bananas and was sort of my maybe my biggest um sort of gripe with the whole thing which was he made this comparison that uh when the bicycle came out everyone just treated it as a tool and there wasn't this hysteria around it which is actually not what happened (laughs) there was hysteria around the bicycle particularly with women riding it and you know God forbid women put some pants on and ride the bicycle around and be able to move from point A to point B. And there was at the time, you know, people would write about, you know, is the bicycle, you know, ruining this or that. So it's not I don't think social media is unique, I think, um, in terms of, you know, inventions that have changed society and had everyone talking about it for that reason. You know, the novel did the same thing. At one point, it was very um you know, it wasn't considered like an educational um, thing to read a novel. You know, it was like a pastime, like how we talk about TV. So um, yeah. it's not the first time we've been through this. And I think looking back at those examples, I think there is more to learn. And I think in the documentary, they just sort of dismiss that line of logic outright um, and consider it ridiculous. But I don't think it is. I think there is something to that. And it's helpful to look back at history and think about that in the way that we talk about uh, social media. Well, you're right. I mean, if you because if you go back to, to why books weren't, I mean, the, the original books were all hand handwritten and they were hand copied. So there might only be ten editions of, of of a book because there were ten monks that, that would sit and, and make copies of, of all the pages. I think that's how they were doing them uh, until the printing press was invented, and then all of a sudden you could have. A little bit more, but it wasn't necessarily what it is now. Where you could pretty much, you know, besides digital books, you can get you know books anywhere. Uh, and and you, you know the other thing about about the bicycle is 
I mean, there isn't, I can't remember the exact phrase, but but the the, the reward per, per pedal, the, the result, the, the, the output you get is almost unmatched in return for every, every, every stride you take on a bike to what you actually get back for the step is, is this, this huge return, um, which I don't think you get from social media. I think social media drains you. Um, mm-hmm. I, I definitely know, with, and the reason why I had to put the limit in, if, if I have a day where I am busy with conference calls and working on stuff and then I'm still looking at social media, you never have a break and you're absolutely mentally exhausted because you, you're just stimulating all the time. So you need to have, um, you need to have breaks, uh, even, even from, you know, hours and hours of conference calls to go and look at not necessarily another screen. You want to go look at a, a book or go walk outside or whatever it is. And you don't necessarily want to go walk outside and pick up your phone and go, Oh, what's happening on Twitter right now? Um, or, you know, whatever, whatever the thing is. So, I th- so I think, uh, you, you're right in the sense that, um, I think they over uh, oversimplified some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't want to dig into that because I know it's it's a it's a can of worms that that probably means that there'll be a sequel uh, or a series of movies about it because it, it is it is complicated topics. But I think the the the, the thing that, that fascinates me is is the ability for um, people to concentrate for long periods of time is 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 reducing every year. Mm-hmm. I don't think people. I don't think there's a there's a conscious we need to, we need to fix that movement because we should be able to concentrate we know we need to be able to do more deep work not not less deep work yeah no i think you're right that the digital nature of it does do something differently to our brains and that you aren't you know it is i think i think there is something about just that we're staring at you know light on a screen versus interacting with the world around us that does um you know, feel different and fatigue you differently than if you are, you know, reading a book or um, what have you. I guess the other part that I really wish they would have maybe explored a little bit, and maybe this was due to a lack of research or there just hasn't been enough time with these things around, but is um, voice assistants and having them in the home and just IoT in general. Because it's not only, I don't even think about just, you know, kids with the smartphones. It's also they have the Alexa in the house. And, like, what is that doing as well? And that's a component that I think uh, is a bit more modern than a lot of what they touched on is voice search. Um, Because they did talk about Google and Google monopolizing search, which is 100% true. Um, All that stuff, it's very familiar to me as a marketer, um, that sort of world of, you know, your business lives or dies by Google and you have to play by their rules. Um, but they're extending that now into the voice realm as well. So that's their next frontier is taking over, you know, instead of typing to search something, we're going to all be using our voice assistants. And I know we all more and more, but that's definitely where things are, are moving. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely an ethical consideration. Um, but I'm almost more okay with 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 that line of direction because I think it's a natural mm-hmm. one. Um, because if you can if you can reduce your need to go um, open a screen and type into and open a Google window and type something, and you can use mm-hmm. voice to do it, you know standing across the kitchen, and tell me you know what the latest score is on X, Y, and Z, um, and that saves you time and that gives you more time back to do stuff with your you know, your family or your work or whatever, then I've got no problem with that. I think the problem I have with, with general social media and, and, and that is, you know, Facebook really made it their business to keep you on it because they need to make revenue. So, so their ethics and their morals and all the rest of it are never about the good of the end user or the good of the, the people on the platform. It's about monetizing the people on the platform. Um, Twitter, to, to a lesser extent, but I think that probably fits in that, you know, the, the blurry lines around that. And so does, so does Google to an extent, but, it, but their sort of platforms fall apart anyway, so I don't think that really matters. Um, I mean, I, I, there aren't many use cases I can think of where social media actually necessarily is, is always a good thing, but there are some where, you know, networking with people like LinkedIn is good for that, um, trying to find someone or, or help from someone that, you know, from your past, you know, it's good for that. And, you know, I live in a country, you know, 10,000 kilometers from my, the rest of my family. So one way for them to stay in contact is via social media. It's not Facebook anymore. Um, move that over to WhatsApp. 
but it's still Facebook because it's owned by Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's probably the other issue is that you, you've got to be very conscious of who owns what technology you're using and what are they going to do with your data? Because in the end, it's your, it's, you're putting your data on their platform and whether they'll give it back to you or whether they'll keep it and use it is, is, is the thing you need to be very clear on. Yeah. So, but anything that, that's put on, at least in South Africa, I don't know if it's true here. I know in South Africa, anything that's put on a WhatsApp group, regardless of it being encrypted or not, if you're the admin of the group, you are responsible for that comment. So if someone says something racist or sexist or defamation or whatever it is, and you don't, and you're the admin and you don't, you don't condone it, uh, you don't um, do what you're supposed to do in the sense of moderate, and someone complains, um, they can take you to court. They can put you in jail. Um, I didn't know that. So I'm not as familiar with WhatsApp. It's just not as popular in the U.S. So I didn't even know. Yeah, and I, I don't yeah. know what was around the world. I mean, I, I just remember there being a case, um, and I think it was a racial thing, if I remember correctly. I think someone was texting someone on the plane, and the, and the passenger who was next to saw what she wrote, and she took her to to court. Um, I'll have to find the article and see if, it's, if I can find it. But but that was you know. As much as people, and this is the thing I don't think a lot of people get or they don't appreciate, is that anything you write on on social media or any any electronic medium um, can be used against you. Um, yeah, it also that, doesn't go away. Which no, a lot of people don't realize it's it's never gone. Which I think is where protecting kids, especially, um, really needs to happen. And I just think about all the cringeworthy things that I did as a teen on Facebook, not thinking that. You know, this lives forever on the internet. Even if you delete it, it's never gone. <laughs> well, it's funny because like, that's the only reason I think I check Facebook is to see what pictures pop up. And I go, oh my God, did we do that really? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, there was something else I wanted to mention. What was it? Oh, so so, so the other thing that we've, we've done, so we, we use gamific- I mean, a lot of these techniques are, are, are sort of gamification of an application. Um, and we've used these techniques in, in various portals and stuff. Um, the thing that I always find fascinating, and you sort of alluded to it when you said that LinkedIn kind of owns the space now. I mean, I, I definitely, any person I meet with, I look, for, I look for their LinkedIn profile and I connect with them or, or whatever it is because I want, you know, that that that's a good way to stay in contact afterwards and also a good way to see if you know your your, your independence, etc. And and I am fascinated about the, the amount of internal social media networks that are created within a business. You'll have a an intranet and you'll have um, you know, a place where you create your own profile and your own skills. Uh, and the intention behind that is also to, to provide this place where you can, you know, interact with, with other stakeholders in your business and, and share knowledge, et cetera. But those don't seem to ever take off. Um, very rarely do you see people duplicate what they've got on LinkedIn to what they have in the internal corporate environment. In fact, most people I know would still work through LinkedIn before they worked internally. In fact, you know, they'd find the person's name and go look them up on LinkedIn, connect with them and then then work with them. Um, it's just an interesting, almost credibility that LinkedIn has. Um, and considering how open it is compared to right. your LinkedIn. Yeah. I'd be curious if, if you have any ideas on why that is. I guess to me, it seems like if you're going to invest your time into something that will, you know, pay off for you in the long term and establish you as, you know, a thought leader. You don't want to do it in the public forum and not on something where, you know, you're only talking to a limited audience. Well, well I think it's, there's, there's two things. One, and I know for me, I'm lazy, so I'm not going to go and do, I'm not going to have two profiles to maintain. Uh, especially if, I'm, if, I, if I know that um, I'm potentially not going to be in that business for more than, you know, two or three years. Uh, which is typically how long I'm involved in a business with anyway. Uh, and LinkedIn is persistent in that sense. Um, but I think the second thing is from a profile point of view, unless, unless I've got the time or it's part of my role to, to be, you know, you know, you see some CIOs that, that'll write a blog every month internally and they'll write something on LinkedIn as well. I mean, they're not writing those blogs typically. I mean, they, yes, they might might jot down some ideas and stuff, but typically they've got, they've got a person on their, their staff that's going to write it for them. Um, that, that to me is the way, the way to do it. And, and until I get to that sort of stage, because my writing is okay, but I think there's people that write much better than I do. Um, 
I think that's that's when you want to build your profile internally. And you can be communicating communicating in most cases via email, not via a social media platform internally. Um, because people typically will read an email that's been officially communicated uh, as much as we, we think they don't, that they tend to, because everyone's comfortable with email. Um, less, co- and you, like I said, you will have people that are, are comfortable with the social media aspects of it. Um, but LinkedIn, in that sense, is is for the is is building as you said building your profile globally, um, which is where you do want to invest your time. You want to be seen typically, I think, as an authentic, credible person. Yeah. This is why at some point you're going to need a job, or, or consulting work, or whatever it is, and you, you need to be able to point them somewhere if you haven't got a website to say, well, there there I am. There's all my activity. Um, there's my there's my connection and my credibility. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know uh, we're up on time, but I feel like we could even do a part two of this because there's a lot. We didn't even you brought up email at the end there, but that's something they also touch on that we didn't even get to. So, and the yeah. whole really work side of this too, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, we, I think we should. I think this is a you know the the user user behaviors and and behavioral economics and, and all those things is a common theme in this space because you are you are trying to understand your your user to make them work. Will make their work as, as efficient and as effective as possible. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's many things, yeah, we should unpack on that definitely. Yeah. Super. Thanks, Heather. Talk cool. to you later. I'll talk to you later. Cool. Cheers, Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.